You are listening to the Think Brick Australia podcast. Think Brick Australia represents the clay, brick and paver manufacturers of Australia. Brick by Brick, our podcast will discuss technical information and architectural case studies with special guests. I'm your host, Elizabeth McIntyre, the CEO of Think Brick Australia. On today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome back Jack Gill, our General Manager here at Think Brick Australia, to talk about silica dust. Welcome, Jack. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's a serious topic and it's one that warrants a really good discussion. That's right, Jack. And there's so much information out there about silica dust. So what we're going to try to do today is really crystallise the key points about what we need to do to keep everybody safe. Let's get started and talk about exactly what is silica dust. Yeah, so it's really important to know exactly what we're dealing with here to ensure that you know anyone working in any industry with materials containing silica, that their safety is prioritised. So crystalline silica is a common mineral found you know, within the Earth's crust and, you know, natural materials, including sand, stone, concrete and mortar and bricks in our case, contain crystalline silica. And it's also used to make other products, including glass, pottery, ceramics. So as you can see, it's quite common and and it is everywhere with all of our construction materials. Now, respirable crystalline silica, which is what we're here to talk about today, this is actually those very small and very fine particles of silica dust. And these are about 100 times smaller than your ordinary sand that you actually might find at the beach. So as you can imagine, we're dealing with incredibly small particles here. Oh, that's tiny. Yeah, and, and when we actually cut or process materials containing silica dust, that is actually then released into the air, which can cause a hazard and a risk to our workers. So, Jack, you really can't actually see silica dust uh, or you can see it en masse or you can't see it. So, obviously, when we're cutting something or an item that contains silica dust, you'll actually see the dust that's expelled when you're cutting that. But those really fine particles, as you said, Elizabeth, we can't actually see those. Yep. And, we, you know, they're not visible to the human eye, which means the risks sometimes aren't really well associated and well known about about RCS or respiral crystalline silica. All right. So what can we do to, I guess, reduce the risk of excess exposure to silica dust? Yeah. So the first thing is obviously understanding what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's understanding, well, how do we actually firstly eliminate the risks of silica dust? And then secondly, if we can't eliminate the risk, how do I actually mitigate or minimise the risk to Australian workers using and being exposed to RCS? And it's a really serious issue because each year in Australia, over 600,000 people are actually exposed to silica dust in the workplace. Wow. And, that's, and that's due to the fact that it's in a lot of the materials we use in everyday construction. So looking at actually how we manage the risks of silica dust. It's about using our hierarchy of controls, which is what a lot of our WHS personnel listening to this podcast may be familiar with. And so what that's about is, again, looking at what's the best and most effective way to minimise and manage risk. And then if you can't action that control, moving down the list to ensure the safety of workers. So When we're actually talking about these hierarchy of controls, the first one on our pyramid and the first one that we should always be striving for is to eliminate the Mm. risk of having to process and cut materials with silica dust. Now, this is where bricks are actually incredibly useful and incredibly handy. As everyone listening to our podcast will know, bricks are fantastic. They're modular. They come pre-cut. They come in their pre-assembled shapes. Mm which means that we don't have to cut them on site or we don't have to cut them as often as comparable building products such as your engineered stone as well as pieces of concrete. So this actually means that a lot of the time with bricks, we can eliminate the risk of actually having to cut bricks and thereby release RCS. Mm. So our second hierarchy of control here is to substitute and, you know, look at putting in products that have lower amounts of silica dust and, and, and a lower risk factor and risk profile. And again, I'm going to use bricks as a fantastic example. If we're comparing bricks to other common construction materials, such as, you know, our engineered stone and other materials that we have to actually heavily process on site, 
your bricks turn up on site and you can simply lay them in your mortar and you don't have to worry about releasing any of that silica dust. Mm -hmm. And in the few instances where you do have to cut bricks, you know, if you're reaching the end section of a wall, you can sort of schedule your day around that and actually make sure that you're doing your cutting in an infrequent manner that's not actually exposing you to as much RCS. Okay. And then what else do you use whilst you're cutting as well to limit sort of the airborne silica dust? Yeah, that's a great question and it flows really nicely into actually where we're getting. So our our third sort of level on our hierarchy of controls is engineering controls. And so with these, this is the type of systems and the type of controls we can put in place to actually minimise the amount of RCS that's actually being discharged or expelled from a product. And a great example of this is wet cutting systems. So if you can imagine cutting a product that has silica, if you use a system that actually has a water suppression system, i.e. it actually discharges water whilst it's cutting, then that actual RCS gets trapped in that water solution and it's actually not then expelled to the air, which reduces your risk factor. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we can use vacuum systems as well, which if you understand the principle similar to a water suppression system, they'll actually suck up the dust that's expelled by cutting, which again reduces the likelihood that you're going to inhale it and become at risk. Yep. Okay. And what what are some of the things that we can do like in terms of monitoring the air around us and things like that? Yeah, so this is a really important point. And again, it goes back down our list for administrative controls. So with these, we're looking at how can we actually schedule our cutting? So can we actually ensure that we're cutting in small batches and not over an extended period of time so we're not releasing large amounts of RCS. And similarly, we can also actually have a look at monitoring the air and actually testing what particles are in the air. And so what we actually have in Australia is a workplace exposure standard or a WES. And that's actually been put in place to protect workers using or being exposed to silica dust. And essentially what that means is our manufacturers, as well as our personnel on job sites, they can actually monitor the air. And if you get more silica dust than what's actually allowed by the workplace exposure standard, then it actually means that you have to stop work. And it means that you shouldn't be going over that WEF to protect the workers on site. And just because we obviously represent manufacturers, what are the duties of the manufacturers with regards to the silica content in bricks? What do they have to do? Yeah, so our manufacturers are incredibly diligent about this. Obviously, they want to prioritise the safety of everyone using clay bricks and pavers. So some of the duties include actually disclosing the silica content of their products so that workers are aware of what percentage is actually silica in, in the different clay bricks that they actually produce. Secondly, it's a really important important job to educate and inform not only those working as part of their teams in the manufacturing process, but also those workers and and contractors are using their products. It's about educating them on the hazards of silica dust and and, and what it actually can do to you long term if you don't control and minimise that risk. And The other main responsibility is to actually train those that are exposed to silica dust on the safety aspects of managing the hazards. So some of the controls and processes that we're actually talking about here today. And one of the things that we're now coming into is getting personal and looking at what can we do for our own self if we are in an environment where there is some exposure? What can we do with regards to protective equipment? So if we're on a job site and cutting or processing of materials containing silica does have to occur, which is often the case, uh, personal protective equipment or PPE is of paramount importance. So this is actually your first line of defence against silica dust exposure. So we're talking about things including eye protection, we're talking about masks and making sure that you've actually fit your mask correctly. And obviously knowing what we've all been through in the With last COVID, two years. With COVID, I feel like we've, we've got this one there covered. Are no, there are no excuses. No. <laughs> uh, and it's also things like eye protection, hearing protection as well, wearing the right work boots and just like small things as well. Like if you're actually cutting products containing silica, in a large volume, it's likely that your clothes might have some of that content on them. So looking at maybe not wearing those clothes home and and washing them separately or washing them before you actually get changed into them again. So really, really small steps, but they make a big difference in terms of long-term worker safety. 
They do. And look, this is quite a lot to absorb, pardon the pun there. So Jack, as an industry, we're obviously concerned about helping everyone ensure that they can comply or use best practice. What are some of the things that we've produced that can help people? By having discussions with our members and our manufacturers here at ThinkBrick, we've actually worked with their teams to actually develop an industry guiding principles for safeguarding against exposure to respirable crystalline silica. And essentially that document is a beautiful summary of what we've talked about today in showcasing what the risks of silica dust is and how anyone working with these products can firstly understand their risk And then secondly, eliminate or minimise that risk. And so what this document actually does is that we've actually passed that on to our manufacturers and then their teams are actually using the principles within that document to formulate their own safety data sheets and their own safety practices when using their specific products. So if you're a worker or if you're someone that is working with these products, then this is probably your first port of call to just understand what the risk profile is and then understand how to minimise that risk. So in summary, Jack, we've discussed the importance of silica dust and how many people it affects. Over 600,000 Australians every year are exposed to that in the workplace. We've looked a little bit about what we can do on site to minimise exposure. We've talked about how the manufacturers have communicated and have worked together to try to reduce the hazards of silica dust in the workplace. And we've also discussed what everyone can do on a personal level to protect themselves if they are exposed. And as you mentioned, and they'll be in the show notes, all of this information is available on our website. Yes, exactly, Elizabeth. And I think as an industry for us, it's all about everyone getting home safely at the end of the day. Thank you, Jack, for helping us understand the implications of silica dust and what we can do to help prevent exposure to it in our workplaces. Always a pleasure again, Elizabeth. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please follow, rate and review our podcast. We are always looking for new ways to think brick. If you have an idea of what you'd like to hear about, there's a link in our show notes to let us know.